We are live and recording. Yay. Hello, everyone. I am so excited because today we are celebrating, drum roll please, the all-consuming world by Kendrick. And if we do a, a little jump to the opposite side, that is the amazing Cassandra who is joining us. And then in the center, we have Sean McGuire who is going to be in conversation with her. And I am so excited. Both of these authors are absolutely fabulous. Um, I'm excited because we're doing two events because Cassandra has two events coming out this fall that are both fabulous. Um, so we are celebrating the all-consuming world, as I said. And then there's also nothing but blackened teeth that is coming out later this year. So soon. Oh, I know. It's like, oh, oh my so God. Soon. So the cover, oh, let's kiss. But, um, and then Sean and many of you also know October Day novels, the encrypted novels, wayward children novels, and then also Middle Game, which was a staff pick as well. So you guys are in expert, amazing hands and before I pass you off to the authors and the cat butts, because you have the glorious presence of many a fuzzy tonight. So before I pass you off to them, um, some health rules, everyone. If you look to the right hand side, that's going to be our chat section. Keep on dropping hellos and whatnots. And then if you look down below, there will be the ask a question button. And I highly encourage you to take advantage of that. All you gotta do is click it, it'll pop up a little box for you and you can write your question. And the best part about events is that you get to interact with the authors, especially these authors. You get to be like, so your book is amazing. How did you come up with this strangely dark and disturbing, fabulous concept? Please, please, please tell me all of the creepy goodness or whatever you want to ask them. Um, and then also if you wish to purchase All Consuming World, if you look down below, there will be that purchase book button. I highly encourage you to hit that. This book has like reincarnation into AI bodies and a quest for someone who they really need to find because there are things going on in the universe and there is a war between AI and humanity. And those are, I'm just throwing a tiny, tiny tip of the iceberg of what is in this <laughs> at you. So on that note, I am going to go ahead and pass it off and I will see you all at the end. Have a good event, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And this might be 40 oh. minutes of us showing off kitties. Hello. It might. Sorry, Thomas was Ooh. doing a yell. This is this what happens when you shave a Maine Coon. Oh no. You still get far too much cat. It's just very sleek looking. You gonna go? You done yelling? Okay. So why I was a need... little, oh, huh? Why did he need shaving? So Thomas, um, like so many of us, and thankfully this predates the global pandemonium we're currently in, has an anxiety disorder. And uh, because he has an anxiety disorder, he overgrooms himself and he swallows his own hair. And he swallowed so much of it that he stopped having hairballs and started having oh, uh, intestinal impaction and had to oh, have no. multiple surgeries to try to clear it out. Uh, oh, and at this point, if we don't keep him shaved, he'll die. Oh, my Lord. Yep. But because he is a Maine Coon, he is incredibly tolerant of anything I want to do. And so I dress him in baby clothes to keep him from licking most of himself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's kind of great. Like, I've got the most dapper cat in science fiction. And it's you for do. his own good, so no one can tell me that I'm being mean to my cat. <laughs> <laughs> they don't try periodically, but I can mostly ignore them. I'm still waiting for somebody to call me mean for Doodle's tail, which needed to be shaved all the way down because she was having Giardia. And the you nice can't let it get stuck in the hair. Yeah, it turned into a paintbrush. So now she does not have a magnificent fluffy tail. Anyway. It's bad, <laughs> but she'll grow it back. Hey, at least the chat is saying that they are that they're excited to see the cats. They're okay with seeing the cats. And remember, I will say for Cass, as I often say for, say for myself, when you buy their book, you directly feed those cats. You can you actually buy treats for those Maine Coon by clicking purchase book and making yourself happy. It's kind That's of amazing. For everybody. It, it really is, especially for the cats, quite honestly. 
Um, but I was a little surprised when they asked if I would blurb the all-consuming world because it's, it's not like I spend a lot of time talking about my passionate love of cyberpunk, mostly because my passionate love of deep cyberpunk doesn't really exist. <laughs> it, I don't hate the genre or I would have declined because I will never say nice things about a book I don't like. But, you know, I, um, I tend to avoid it because it is such a phenomenally on the dominance. Cats are great, aren't they? We're not talking <laughs> to cats tonight. We're talking to cats. Um, but I'm still listening. Oh, I know. Cyberpunk is generally such a intensely straight, toxic masculinity experience that even though I trust you as an author because I've really enjoyed your shorter work, I was a little bewildered by like, why the hell would anyone think that I'm going to want to watch a bunch of straight white dudes rampaging around the galaxy trying to save the world? Oh, because that is 100% not what I am getting here. Um, and I feel like the all-consuming world is going to get held up a huge amount as being, hello kitty, as being the queer cyberpunk experience that we've all been waiting for, because it is, it is beautifully queer science fiction but it's also intensely good science fiction especially oh, for a person oh thank you so much it this I, this event is literally my job to say nice things about your shit like i wouldn't if i didn't like it but it's literally my job right now you can look embarrassed I, if you oh, want it still, makes me, still makes me feel really awkward because i really do love your work and oh. i think someone who i respect like my things means a lot to me um, so if i can make cast turn purple i get an award no, no, this is no, no purple cast. I'm already on Benadryl. I don't, I don't need to have another strange medical condition <coughs> happen to me. For context for the chat, we have discovered that I am very, very allergic to, I guess, the undercoat of my main cues, and I've spent all day sneezing. So I've had to get medication. So I'm slightly uh, at a moment. Uh, but on the all-consuming world, I really, really wanted to queer it up as much as possible and keep it entirely centered on issues that AFAP people do face a lot um, and just kind of interrogate that interaction between how queer people move through, like, you know, cishet white spaces. And the result is a very odd little book, I think. It but is very like odd, it. but it's beautiful. It reads kind of like a um, a cyberpunk RPG that has actually been translated into novel form. Like you're reading somebody's fantastic campaign. So there's all this backstory and all this depth that you don't have. And I think that was the thing that impressed me the most. You've got a remarkable amount of confidence with world building in that you're not giving us the scaffolding piece by piece, which is something I will literally never be able to resist. Uh, and that was just really beautiful because it meant that I kept going to find out more. Are you planning to do anything else with this universe? Um, I don't know yet. Maybe in the future, I currently have like 600 million contracts that I'm trying to desperately make a deadline on. <laughs> So when those are done, I can think about more books in that world. But I would like to revisit it, honestly. Um, each of the Dirty Dozen, I feel, has a story to tell the world, a story of their own that exists independent of the book. If I'm looking suspiciously towards a side, it's because there is a cat wandering by. You have two cats and a lot of drugs in your system. Right now, we are not going to object to anything that is not suddenly throwing paint at the screen. I promise I will not throw paint at the screen, but I might get distracted. I did a live convention panel once where I got so sick during the con that I had to take two paracetamol and then passed out midway through the panel, like literally just face down on the counter, unconscious. Oh, no. So you are doing really? great. Mm-hmm. I've never done anything like that while I was on medication, but I once had a podcast that I think was like at 5 a.m. in the morning. And at some point, I just nodded off. And the host just very quietly went, Cassandra, are you still there? <laughs> and somewhere in the internet, there is a foot, there is a recording of me going, what? Oh, 
had yes, I'm a white what? And we'll never ever link to the podcast again. They were very kind about it, but it was the first and only time I've passed out. I can't believe you passed out in the middle of a panel. That is wow. It was um, I would say it was fun, but it really was just the world went away and then everything was gone. Oh no. <laughs> Did so, you finish you both, your point? Huh? I, I don't think I finished my point. No. I, I also don't think I passed out mid-sentence. <laughs> it was one of those, you know, where we were talking about the origins of urban fantasy, which is basically what my degree is in as a folklorist. And we had me and a couple of people who actively write urban fantasy. And then one gentleman who read a Jim Butcher book once and was convinced that he knew more than any of the rest of us. Oh, and no. so he was talking. And you never want to let on when your other panelists are boring you. It's so rude. But he just wouldn't stop. And he had one of those voices that's like a <laughs> lullaby in that it just it never varies. It's all on the same note. It's all on oh, the same no. tone. And you're playing the drone. And I'm sick as hell. And I'm marginally stoned. And this is very soothing, and also I hate you. So now I'm asleep. Oh no! Uh, so you also have nothing but blackened teeth coming up, which is a novella rather than a novel, mm -hmm. and that's from Tor.com Publishing, it, right? Uh, Nightfire, actually. Nightfire. Okay, very cool. I, yeah, and that's great. Come out. I'm thinking about slightly more than a month. I hope next year I will not have this many releases timed so closely together, but that's how they shaped out. Yeah, that that would be um, a hope I know nothing about. <laughs> Your release schedule is terrifying. Brutal. Yes. But I understand it is also the result of you being able to like Tetris your schedule perfectly to perform that. It takes a lot of work, but it really is the only way that I can stay only three people rather than having to turn into four or five. Um, I write two books more per year than we can find time in the schedule to publish. Oh, so my. when I die, my estate is just going to VC Andrews my corpse for like a decade. Which is not going to be the most fun thing ever. Um, but I'll be dead, so who cares? Fair. With death goes all of the worries that we held in life unless you're one of the members of the dirty dozen in which case it's just going to track you to the next existence hello there is a cat on that side so i did have a oh hello baby hi she was very startled by something and i don't know what it was yeah no go back to looking at us you have such a pretty face oh um so i did actually have a question about your reincarnation tech which mm -hmm. Is there any delay between the personality capture and basically, is there any delay in the backups? If I blew you up fast enough, could I create a gap? You would definitely create a gap. The clone technology in that world is imperfect to begin with. It wasn't ever intended to be a thing that allowed for perfect copies. It was so that people could endlessly create manual labor and just chuck it in there. Was well, I don't know, about 80% of the training that was instilled in the original. And That's nice. this is, oh, hello, Elsie. Mine are being a little more standoffish, so I figured I'd take the computer to them. She really I am looks still like listening. Now. It's just Elsie's turn to look at you. I am very distracted by cats as well. That's fair. We are all cat people. Hello. What are you doing here? That has been one of the few good things about this whole stupid uh, all of our events are virtual thing is that the cats get to come. Verity would like to speak to the manager of your Benadryl. I too would like to speak to the manager of my Benadryl. I did not sign up for it lasting as long as I did. She really does have a face that looks like she's about to speak to a manager constantly. She does. It's just something in the way she's put together. She is the Karen of cats. And we love her. That is not an insult. She's just... She's here to make sure that she gets every penny off that that coupon allows. As she should. All those pennies will get more catnip and more cat toys. Mm-hmm. 
Tinkerbell's downstairs right now. Otherwise, she'd be up here being ridiculous at you. That cat is unrealistic. Oh, she does not look real either. She just looks like a tiny, a very large cotton fluff that somebody stitched eyes onto in a pair of triangular yeah, she, ears. she looks like a cartoon character. I don't know how. Cats. So, so, yeah. So far, everything I've seen about the all-consuming world has been very positive. Um, I think people are genuinely liking it, which is great. Makes me happy. Um, I, I love that the cats are just like, even when we don't carry the computer around to point at the cats, the cats are just going to make sure that this stays a cat-based event. Sorry to any people who do not like cats. <laughs> oh, but Liz Gorinsky says, one of my sugar gliders is watching this event from my bra, and I can't decide if she's freaked out by the cats or just concentrating very hard on your conversation. Either way, <laughs> that's the cutest thing. It is. The all cat zooming world. Oh my god. Yes. I need to write my own fact fan fiction involving cats now. Yes, you do. Oh, I would no. like to see the dirty dozen recast as cats. I immediately tried to figure out who what breed each of them would be. I'm fairly certain Maya would be a Siamese cat from the way she endlessly fucking screams. Oh yeah. Modern style tell. Siamese need to get one of all Siamese. And I guess Vertigress would be the main coon because she is, the, well, he is the intergalactic pop star and that seems appropriate, I think. I, I don't know. I'm thinking about our discussion we just had about Tinkerbell being completely unrealistic. I think Vertigree might be a bicolor ragdoll. I could see that. I could absolutely see that. He's kind just of very that. soft and sweet. Mm -hmm. I am too striking to believe in. This is an accurate description. For those who have not yet read, read the book, um, among other things, uh, among the heist and the reincarnation tech and the gore, there is a lot of gore. There is also an intergalactic pop star who shows up and the dirty doesn't crash her performance. He's okay with it though, largely. Yeah, it's pretty great. Um, and I really appreciate how well you handled people's reactions to the fact that Vertigree has changed pr pronouns since that they were largely dealing with him. Mm -hmm. And the fact that which pronoun is appropriate is very situational. You know, if he is in full Vertigree mode and being a beautiful lady, then yes, she, her is the appropriate thing. And that's just really great to see that normalization. I would like you to sneeze again. That was the cutest sound I've heard all week. <laughs> It might happen. It might. Just stick a cat to your face for a minute. <laughs> you are not the first person who has demanded that I sneeze again. The last time I did that in front of a friend, he stared at me. I just went, does anyone have a handful of dust? I wish to cram it at Cassandra's face. I mean, when I yawn, it sounds like I'm trying to summon nightingales. I hit notes that no one has heard before, but they only happen yawning. So. I'm not going to be able to go to my grave without hearing you yawn now. You will at some I'm point. So Probably curious. not tonight because you are interesting, even stoned. Thank you. And I'm enjoying the ongoing cat chatter in the side. <laughs> I do. And I'm enjoying the cat chatter. Cats are always good. Also, a mashup with the all consuming world and cats the musical would weirdly work. Yes, there is it would. darkness in that in cats the musical for it to just mesh kind of perfectly memory who's that corpse on the pavement <laughs> i can't locate my right arm you know it'd be it'd be messy nothing wrong but with that. finding a way to scan to jellicle is going to be a nightmare oh god I am Your brain is going to run that on a background pa pattern for the next. It day. is. You can you can tell conscious just kind of ticking along like, hmm. We need to write this at some point, and that would be very concerning. Also, you have an amazing singing voice. I don't think I've ever oh, heard you sing before. 
That there is, is an true. old man cat fascinated with your singing as well. It, Shep has great cats. Um, be a fun yes. time. Yeah, Shauna can be in a musical if a musical ever happens involving my book. <laughs> I mean, it it could. We've had musicals of Stranger Things, honestly. Um, you know, Wicked should never have been a musical, much less a successful one. We now have musicals of both the life of Alexander Hamilton and the Six Wives of Henry VIII. Musicals just do what they want. My question would be, how does one? transfer all that gore onto the stage because the all-consuming world is an incredibly bloody book and Shannon looks like she has ideas on how that might happen okay so there is a musical called evil dead the musical that is straight up the horror movie no. seriously theaters theaters that do evil dead the musical put in sprinkler systems most of the time to deliver the sheer quantity of blood and ichor necessary to the audience who sits in the first three rows that are called the oh. splash zone. There is a song called What the Fuck Was That? The opening number is Cabin in the Woods. And at the end of the show, several of the, uh, of the chorus members come out with super soakers full of blood to make sure that if you're in the splatter zone, you get the full experience. I have attended Evil Dead the Musical while wearing a thrifted wedding dress from Goodwill just because Ooh. I wanted to find out if they would actually target me if I showed up in white lace. And yes, they did will. They? they sure did. I left red. I looked like I was coming from a production of Carrie, which is also a musical. I have to go to one of these. I, yeah. I wish to sit in the splash zone and emerge covered in blood to frighten people as a wonder home. Singing and you don't wear glasses, language. so you will have a better time than I do. <laughs> Wait, I thought the glasses would protect you a little bit. Well, the glasses keep it out of my eyes, but while I can squint my eyes shut to make sure that they don't get blood in them, I can't squint my lenses shut. <gasps> oh, no. Fair point. So, yeah, we, we could absolutely uh, get the necessary level of gore. There have been science fiction musicals before. There have been horror musicals before. So... If you're a musical composer and you're out there listening, Cass might be willing to talk to you about licensing. So much. I've never wanted anything more in my life. Not film, not TV, it's nothing. Just somebody give oh, yeah. me a, a musical. Oh, yeah, a musical is a dream. <gasps> um, someone whose screen name I can't pronounce says, one of my favorite musicals is the Heather's musical. Yes, is in the black comedy about high school students killing each other. Heather's The Musical is not only brilliant, it introduced us to Barrett Wilbert Weed, who went on to play Janice in the musical version of Mean Girls. I'm really behind on all of my musical watching. I have to go through YouTube for some of these, at least. Yeah, I'm going to send you so many links. Yes, please. Thank you. I want to Yay. Better, please. We should probably talk about the book, too. I'm sorry, everybody. We, it's been yeah, we should talk about the book some more. And musicals. But <laughs> again... You're stoned, and we're all a little cabin fevery by this point in the panini, so I think that we're allowed to be a little odd, as long as we keep reminding people to please buy the book. Please buy the book. It means a lot. It is my first novel, first proper original novel. Technically, I've done several non-original stuff. And it is so good. It's so much fun. Like, it's, it's just nice to see someone do something original in a space that we're all kind of familiar with by this point. And it is so, it crosses so many lines that you didn't realize you were already coloring inside. You know, I wish so I could say that, yeah. It's just a lot of fun. I did not think I was going to like the all-consuming world. I picked it up and read it because uh, Martin, oh. who is, is with us in the chat, asked if I would blurb it and sent it to me. And so I'm like, okay, well, it's in my house. I will go ahead and, and give this a look. I like Cass. I've enjoyed their other work. Um, I believe that I had blurbed with Blackened Teeth in the same year. <laughs> with Blackened Teeth is freaking genius. I realize that's not the primary focus of tonight's event, but it is coming up. I am very much looking forward to losing the Hugo Award in 2022 to with Black and Teeth. It deserves it completely. 
Um, oh my which is God. about two slots on the ballot, but still, I, I just, it's so good. I love it when I run into something where I'm like, if I am up on award ballots against this, I'm going to lose and I'm going to hug the person that wrote it. Um, James Mender says, a book question. They're called The Dirty Dozen. Did you watch that movie before or during the writing of the book? Long, 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 long before. Uh, my dad had a love for movies like that. I have not watched it since because I have a complicated relationship with my dead father and I do not need more triggers with him. That is completely fair. We have things built into our storytelling DNA by early experience that we have really no interest in or need to revisit. Um, yeah. I, every time someone says something about formative years and influences, I still cannot stop thinking about how my parents insisted I watched John Calvert this the thing between the ages, I think six to eight, I cannot recall. And they were very insistent that I keep my eyes open throughout all of it. And about 30 years later, I'm like, I wonder why I write so much gore. I think I know. I, I That is literally one of the four <laughs> movies I was not allowed to watch. The first movie I can remember watching was Alien when I was three. And I was not allowed to watch the thing because everyone thought it was going to freak me out. I have a lifelong phobia of pudding because I watched the stuff too many times. Um, so I'm just, that is, you win. You win for childhood. Why are you letting the child watch this horror experiences? <laughs> it's not a competition I realized we were having, but you have won it. I don't want to have won it, although it is, has done good things for my writing 30 years later. It has, and your writing is fantastic, so... Yay, team childhood trauma, I guess. Childhood trauma. Only good when you can monetize it. I think that is the story of our entire profession. It really is. Heart truth. And it, it is now 7.30, which I think is when we're supposed to go to Q&A and take the audience questions. And we do have some questions in the bar. Okay. There he is. Um, so what scene or section brought you the most joy or satisfaction to write in the all-consuming world? Um, there is a short interlude where Maya goes off to find one of her former colleagues. And what she ends up finding is the colleague's former spouse. And I loved writing that because Maya, for those who write a little bit of the chapters and what have you, is an absolutely feral creature. She wants to bite everything because she is a ball of pain and she has no idea how to communicate with the world except with she, unless she's shooting it. And the former colleague's spouse is just aggressively kind. She ignores all of Maya's swearing. She ignores all of Maya's posturing and just kind of out nices her. Like it was very fun bludgeoning somebody, like bludgeoning Maya with niceness until Maya sat down and went, I don't know what to do with this. So that was my favorite that, part. Yeah, that is essentially how one deals with feral cats. So um, our next question is, tell us about Pimento. <laughs> um, all Pimento wants is to learn. He wants to cultivate information. He wants to have an intricate knowledge of every kind of rock on every planet. And he wants to lovingly pass it on to the rest of the conversation because he feels everyone needs to know the fine detail. Needless to say, no one really <laughs> pays any attention to him. But he is immortal as an AI, and he's going to keep doing that until people recognize his genius. Okay. What was the inspiration behind the all-consuming <clears throat> It actually started as a tie-in novella um, for a friend's game. And... Somewhere along the line, um, real life circumstances made it really difficult for them to finish editing it. And it just kind of hung there for like three, four years. And I don't know if you ever feel like your characters are more alive than 
they should be. But there was a large part of me that just couldn't deal with the idea of just leaving Maya trapped in this one arc, this one minimal arc, never being able to escape always and always in pain. And so that led me to dragging <coughs> the book off to a bunch of people, including my editor, who came back and went, I think this is a novel. And she was right. She was so right. Yes. And you know, I feel the same way about characters. It is the thing that makes me worst to game with because I will hound you for, I think my current record is 26 years to make sure that if we don't finish the campaign, we at least sit down and talk through where the characters wind up. Gaming and writing are not the same thing, but I have to finish stories or they eat me alive. So that makes perfect sense. I would do um, that too. You, I still, I still want to see where Enora's story goes. Mm -hmm. If only we knew where to find that GM. Hmm. Hmm. Wonder where he has gone. Yep, we're I'm subtle. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> How did you develop your characters for the all-consuming world? I don't know. I've been asked this question so many times by people and sometimes, well, very often it's just, I see flashes of them almost when I'm showering, when I'm working out, when I'm walking long distances. And I get this sense of what they are and then I come back and start nailing details to them until they become fully fleshed. Okay, that I think makes as much sense as this belief that people who don't have to live with their heads like this have that we sit down and build characters on purpose rather than just being constantly harassed by a chorus of silent voices from the insides of our own heads. So what kind of research did you do for the all-consuming world? Did you have to research AI a lot for it? Um, not actually. Um, long before I went into journalism or all kinds of writing and game development stuff, I actually worked as a programmer and I specialized in AIs. I used to build neural networks. So I had a pre-existing knowledge base for a lot of this that I extrapolated from and completely messed with. It is not genuinely accurate to anything. But that does kind of explain some of the confidence that you brought to your AI sections. There was never a sense that you didn't know what you were reaching for. Maybe what you were reaching for would not actually work in this world, but you knew where it was and you were going to take it off that shelf. And that plays really nicely in text. Thank you. Was it easy to switch between writing different genres or did you have to do something to help your mind switch gears? For example, to go from science fiction to horror. Um, I've never had a problem bouncing between genres. I think I like some genres better than others. Other, um, some come more easily. Horror comes very easily to me because my parents were terrible people. It made me watch all kinds of terrible, terrible things when I was younger. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it was easy switching between genres. Very nice. So if the all-consuming world went to Broadway, what actor or actress would you want to play Vertigree? I am completely horrendous at fan casting things. So I'm going to turn that question to you. Who would you recommend? So I don't actually remember what was Vertigree's original base human ethnic background. because so I don't want to accidentally whitewash them. Um. They don't have any specific ethnic background. Okay, so they we can are, go anywhere yes. and we're entirely accurate. Yes, um, they are definitely mixed. Um, everyone fantastic. in the book is. Well, I knew that, but I, I don't want to be like, this is the darkest character in here, and I'm going to say Dove Cameron, who is the whitest living girl alive, um, or something vice versa. So if we were casting right now today uh, based on who is performing on the Broadway stage, who is kind of available uh, for Vertigree, I would 
kind of want to go and rob Hades Town blind and take Ava Noblenzada. Uh, she is oh. fantastic. She's got a great belt, which Verdigree would need to have. She's also got a fantastic upper register, which Verdigree would need to have. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some of the Broadway miscast stuff where she's been playing trouser roles. So we know that she's comfortable with that and we wouldn't be asking an actress to do something that made her feel bad about herself. Um, and if she was, if she was not available or if you wanted to uh, leave her in Hades town for just a second longer, um, I'm looking up a name really quickly. Is the Pasadena Playhouse did a little shop of horrors rendition in 2020 and they had uh, Tammy Blanchard. Mm -hmm. Was it Tammy Blanchard for Audrey? No, that was not the original. They're bringing it back again. Um, oh, MJ Rodriguez. Oh. Who would be amazing. She is, uh, she's originally from Jersey. She is currently doing a lot of work out here on the West Coast. Oh, I can still see her as Vertigree. Um, yeah. And she was the first transgender woman of color to play Audrey uh, in really? any That's kind awesome. of profession, in oh. any professional production of Little Shop of Horrors. I think she would do a really good job as Vertigree too. I'm, I'm trying both to go for actors who would be comfortable in the role and for ones who have the vocal range for mm -hmm. what you would want to envision for, I'm the greatest chanteuse of my age. So that was a lot of time on a very frivolous question, but I hope that the person who asked it feels great. Um, out of the 12, is there one character that you connect with the most or who represents you? Um, I definitely, I think, connect with Maya the most. Um, I tend to reach for anger when I'm trapped in traumatic situations. When I was younger, it was definitely externalized. Now that I'm older, most of the anger gets redirected into the engine of my creative production and fuels the things that I do. But I definitely get my and I definitely get that impulse to just beat things until they stop hurting you. That makes a lot of sense. And Maya is wonderful. Like you could pick way worse avatars in that setting than Maya. <laughs> Maya is full feral, absolutely. But I love the feral girls. They make me so happy. I do too. I think I recognize too much of myself and them not to. So what were some of the key things you kept in mind when writing the AI characters versus the human characters? How do you keep them feeling non-human rather than just sort of sliding into humanity light? Weirdly, it was kind of tough. Um, I wanted them to be curious about humanity and not necessarily apis. So I wanted them to have an almost academic approach to understanding human traits and communication. So they pull things from everything else because they're not really sure what works for them and they're just jabbing them together to see how it feels and to see if they enjoy feeling the way humans feel. And I always wanted to keep that sense of distance there in a sense that everything is an aesthetic that could be shed. So I kept those things in mind primarily. And I tried my best to be very careful about how the AIs represented themselves. They were, some of them like Pimento were coded very masculine. They took uh, he, him pronouns, but at the same time, it was an active choice. It wasn't an active choice because they felt that way, but because they were curious about it. So I guess it goes back to what I just said. Gay Benadryl, I tended to have my AIs treat humanity as just a very curious puzzle to poke at. One that came with zero instructions. Nice. That was were a very complicated time? It was. It's so nice of us to throw super complicated questions at you while you're faintly stoned. We're yes. kind people here. So, um, but we are running through the questions and so far you've answered them all beautifully. 
Were there any challenges you ran into going from writing novellas to writing a full length novel? Yes, the lake. <laughs> I was so not used to it. Um, my co writer, Richard Kadri, was actually one of the reasons I managed to find confidence for that because I spent weeks screaming at him, going, I don't know what I should sign myself up for. Oh my God, I can't do this. And he sort of sighed and went, Think of it as three separate novellas with. Um, arcs tying them to one another and the light bulb went off. And Sarah Guan, my editor, did all the rest of the work in that regard um, and talked me through a whole bunch of things, including what should propel people through the plot, um, the need for quieter moments, the key, need to just sit down and explore the interiority of each character. Um, but yeah, basically there were challenges up and down the wazoo and I went run screaming to Moscow <laughs> if it wasn't for the two of them. To Moscow specifically? I don't know why Moscow. I think it's because I live in Quebec and Moscow is a lot warmer during most parts of winter. Okay. I mean, we all have the places that we would flee to and they don't have to make sense. I would flee to Disney World because it has so many frogs. That's very specific. Why why are the frogs that important? There are I like so frogs, many and sure. they're so good. They just oh. stick to everything. Oh. One of the only things that got me through the part of the like the first six months of lockdown was thinking about how, in the absence of humans, the frogs had full dominion over Disney World. Oh. And I just think about frogs riding the roller coasters when they did the ride tests to make sure that the brakes didn't seize up during uh, during idleness. And, you know, oh. frogs covering the outside of Snow White's mine train. and Frogs. Oh, that's... Oh, I see your point. That just sounds just, very I lovely just, and peaceful. Yeah, it would be so peaceful. And also they would stick... They will, in fact, stick to your face just like those glue on gems that you used to get when you were a kid and would put to your cheeks and chin. And, you know, I used to cover my eyebrows in them and they could be frogs instead of sticky rhinestones. And that's magical. It is. Okay, I'm so going to have... enjoy that. If it's who, of the... who of the cast was the most fun to write and who was the most challenging? Rita was the most challenging, I think. Um trying to dig into the mind of a literal psychopathic abuser was hard and an incredibly uncomfortable space to be in. And holding her in my brain was a very icky, icky few months. But it had to be to be able to fully communicate what was going on and how she was mistreating everyone else. Um, and really, it's going to be a cop out, but Maya is just so much fun to write. Uh, I've been getting a bunch of one-star reviews because occasionally I do look at good reads and because sometimes people message me about it. And despite how many of those people hate the fact that she uses the word fuck a lot, I really enjoyed writing it. I know. I should have liked Goodreads. I'll say you, it. You should, <laughs> though. I will say that Goodreads, at least usually when they're one-starring your, your book, they're one-starring it because it has the word fuck in it too often or because it contains queer people. Um, I, I had one person one-star one of my books because I had misspelled the name of a Scottish mythological figure who shows up in exactly two classic uh, texts with different spellings of her name, one of which is the one I declared canonical. And I was just like, oh, I know exactly who your folklore professor was. And uh, we went to different schools. So you can bite me. But, you know, Goodreads reviews, they will usually at least be responding to the text in some way. One star reviews on Amazon are things like the cover was ripped. My postman dropped the package into a puddle. My dog ate the book. So you shouldn't read either of those. If you want people to say bad things about your books, just DM me on Twitter and tell me that's what you need to feel fulfilled right now. I will come up with something shitty to say. I will find you something terrible to say. Um, but we have one question left. Yeah, if you do take me up on it, you will find that I can be really mean. 
Um, this is a question for both of you. Writing gore and biopunk feels like a very specific skill. How do you think it differs from writing less violent or body horror-ish material? I don't know. Most of everything I write has gore. The one time I tried paranormal rom-com, there was an entire section with bloody things. And my editor had to remind me that this was a paranormal rom-com so that I got moved away. Why is Sean making that face? I was just, the thought of you writing paranormal rom-com is probably relatively close to what actually happened when you tried and it's hilarious. Like that's that's gonna just be my happy thought for the rest of the night. Um, wow. So what I have discovered is I'm actually not great at writing gore. I want to be. I yearn for Cassandra's skill at taking a person apart and telling you what everything inside them looks like, because I am more interested than the scalpa the, in the scalpel than the slime. I want to understand the science behind what's being done to the body. I want to comprehend the layers of the torture. So rather than talking about how gross it is that someone has just been sliced open, I'll be like, let's name the organs. Let's look at the fascia. Isn't this horrible? Aren't we having a good time? I love so, that about your work. It it's fun happy. and it, it's where my head lives, but I think the seaweed is always greener in somebody else's lake. You sneezed again, you're my favorite. <laughs> I'm going to get a DM later tonight because Sandra's going to be like, I am so self-conscious about my sneezes and I hate you now. But oh, um, no. it's fine. It's fine. So unless they have failed to clear the question. Yes, I think we have now answered all of the questions that were in there. Yay. Yay. I promise I will have less than I for the next event, whoever's following yeah. you to the next one. Or at least I very much hope so. Well, I, I hope for your sake you have less Benadryl, but also it is mildly amusing as well. So I don't wish you allergic reactions, but. <laughs> um, and also, too, the sneeze is ridiculously cute. Um, but I want to thank you so very, very much for joining us and for celebrating the all consuming world. It's just, oh, I'm. Thank you. I'm so happy we're getting like full length novels from you and that we're getting to share them with readers because you are just an author we're really excited to have in the genre and all the things coming from you. So on that note, I want to just thank everyone so much for joining. Yeah, say goodbye to the Everybody, oh, wait, everybody grab a cat. cat. Okay, okay. I, have to, I have to take my computer to a cat because the cats are not really fit and grabbable right now. So my cat, my cat, goodbye. Oh, hello. <laughs> so on okay. this very fluffy note, we are going to say goodbye Bye. to everyone. Um, before though, where can everyone find you on social media or newsletter or whatever? Because both of you, as you mentioned earlier, are always coming out with amazing works. So where can people find you to stay up to date? Twitter.com, cast call. Awesome. Yep. If you can spell my name, you can find me pretty much everywhere. Oh, <laughs> oh I, 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 thank you, Marty. So if you get the all-consuming world now, you also get an enormously cool game created by Gion that is based in the world and draws inspiration from it. I know I am definitely stoned in Benadryl that I completely forgot about that. Thank you. But it's a really I fun thing to get when you order the book. Fluff friends and skin friends. So I guess we get to keep having skin. Good for us. Hey. Yay. So, so yeah, if you can... If you can spell my name, you can find me. There are like 17 Sean and McGuire's in the world. The other 16 are my cousins, and they're all sheep farmers in Ireland. So they are not so active in the land of the social medias. So I'm on Twitter, Tumblr, TikTok. I'm everywhere. And if you look at the bottom of your screen before we are knocked off, I'm pointing directly at it, though I don't know if that's the case for your screen specifically. There's a little button that says purchase books. If you purchase that book and buy yourself a copy of The All-Consuming World, and I can say this because I don't benefit from the book like Cass does, so I don't have to be shy about it, but if you purchase that book, you not only benefit an independent bookstore and an awesome up-and-coming science fiction publisher, 
you give cats, those, those cats that you saw tonight, you give treats directly to those cats. Yeah. And treats are not free, especially good treats. We need to sell books so that we can feed our cats the way they deserve to be fed. This is true. And so they don't eat us. Yeah, they will totally eat us in the night. Maine Coons are huge and they will hollow us out like dogs in elk. Yes, yeah, so help us get food for them so it doesn't happen. We're ending the event with all of our skins, so we wish to maintain all of our skins. So thus the treats are very important, everyone. Um, so go by the all-consuming world for a very much needed fresh take on cyberpunk that I'm so excited we have in the genre. And thank you so much to sh Oh, oh yes. This is the last cat we did not see tonight. <laughs> This is Meg. And Meg is without question the stupidest mammal you will ever behold. She is roughly as bright as bread mold, but she's happy, so we don't care. I'm almost jealous of that. I am too. I am actually right? jealous Her piece of that. is immense. <laughs> but thank so you. Thank you, Mysterious so Galaxy. Much. Yes, thank you, Sean, and thank you so much, Cassandra. Everyone, make sure you check in to next time because for your next book, amazing, amazing horror novel. Um, we're gonna be doing an event closer to October and all the spooky good feels. So make sure to check that out. And we will see you all next time. The all consuming world is out in the universe. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>